Well, stress is part of life. Now, I know that's one of those statements that everybody says, yeah, well, duh, we all know that. We all experience that. It's, you know, doesn't take, um, you know, a keen, astute person to, to figure that out and let you know. But it's also one of those statements, you know, that is, as a, as a lead into a sermon, it's kind of like, oh, that's kind of a downer. Stress is part of life, right? It's almost like, Stress is part of life, so get over it or, you know, um, you know th- that kind of thing. But that's not what I mean when I say that. Because when I mention that, when I say that stress is part of life, the only reason that I can stand here and say that is because I know that there is an antidote to the stresses that we face in our lives. And we're going to be sharing that antidote with you uh, over the next several weeks. We're talking about... Um, uh, what God's Word has to say about our, the, the stresses, the anxieties, the fears that we experience every day. And we do face pressures and, and stresses all the time. Uh, pressure to perform on the job. Uh, pressure to meet deadlines, to pay bills, to, to get the grades. To meet the expectations of the people around us, whether they're employers or, or friends or family. And we stress over questions of our health so often, about how our kids will behave, uh, uh, or whether they'll follow Jesus or not, or whether, they'll, or whether we'll be good parents, if we'll find the right spouse, if we'll find the right job, whether or not we'll be accepted into social groups, whether I'll be able to sustain myself through, through retirement, and the list goes on and on. And one of the places that we find encouragement in times of stress and anxiety is actually in the Psalms. Um, The the Psalms of the Bible, most of them we know were written, a a great portion of them, written by King David. And uh, he wrote so much out of personal experience. I mean, he knew uh, what it was like uh, to be um, in stressful situations. He knew what it was to be pursued by people who wanted him dead. He knew about uh, making sinful choices that affected the lives of so many people. And he knew the pressures of leadership. And they were heavy. And the Psalms we'll be looking at over the next several weeks reveal to us how by God we can be restored and refreshed as we deal with circumstances that are stressful in our lives and, and, that are, and, and, and anxiety that can be absolutely paralyzing. And so we begin then this series with really, I think, one of the most prolific, one of the, the greatest psalms uh, regarding things like stress and fear and anxiety, and that's Psalm 23, as you can see up there on the screen. The 23rd Psalm. And uh, it's, it's from this psalm that we've taken the title of this entire series. Come, the, the, the title is Restore, and that comes from the verse where it says, He restores my soul. It's, it's uh, early on in, in the psalm. But uh, that is really what we see uh, as the remedy of, of, for, for stress and anxiety and fears is that we need the restoration of soul that only God can give to us. So Psalm 23, certainly, again, the, the best-known, most quoted psalm uh, that, uh, uh, that we know, especially when it comes to times of crisis, times that cause us fear and, and uh, worry, or in times of, of, of grief, of losing a loved one. We've been, but many of us have been to many funerals. I have officiated in many funerals and memorial services where the 23rd Psalm was, was read and it was really a, a, a source of encouragement for, for those who were listening, those who were grieving. It's a great restorative psalm that has been a comfort to millions of people throughout history. And so we get to look at Psalm 23 this morning. So take your Bibles and turn there if you have your Bibles with you this morning. I hope you do. Turn there, or if you have the uh, Venture app, you can uh, look it up there as well under the sermon notes. 
And uh, we're going to be taking this, this psalm and just breaking it down. And, and it is a psalm, like I say, it's probably the, the most well-known song, uh, psalm. And probably more people in this room have memorized that psalm than maybe even uh, any other psalm. And besides maybe John 3.16 than any other scripture in, in the Bible. And yet, sometimes uh, familiarity with something such as the 23rd Psalm, uh, can cause us to lose sight of really the the power and the significance and the the meaning that is there. And we kind of tend to just let it kind of be something that we recite by rote. We know the words, but we don't often give a lot of thought to what they mean and really really how they impact our, our lives. And so... Uh, let's look at that, that, at that psalm together. You may even be able to quote it um, from memory. We'll have it up on the screen, actually, as we go through it. But uh, it simply says this, The Lord is my shepherd. Actually, I, I forgot to tell you this. We're going to say this together in unison, okay? Um, I, I, I realized that I was the only voice um, talking for a second here. Um, but we're going to do this in unison, all right? So let's say, re- recite this, read or recite this, this uh, psalm. And I really want to invite you not to rush through it, not to just kind of go, you know, like you would if you were in Iwano, you know, back in the day, you know, where's my shepherd? Get my star, you know. Let's, let's, let's kind of savor. Let's kind of savor what it says, okay? All right. So, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for You are with me. Your rod and Your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Well, this psalm, as we've just read it together, really boils down to one singular truth that is contained in the first part of its first line, and that is, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. That life-giving, life-determining truth is all that we need to know. And I'm serious about this. I mean this. It's all that we need to know, not only when we face the common stresses, fears, and crises of life, but especially in the worst of the worst of life. That statement, the Lord is my shepherd, is all that we, can, that we need to know. And it can make a night and day difference in perspective and in confidence and in peace that we experience as we go through the most difficult circumstances of life. The Lord is my shepherd. Think about that short statement just for a moment. The Lord is is my shepherd. Now let's just break it down. Because what does that mean? Well, it's the Lord is my shepherd. It's the Lord. The word there for Lord is the Hebrew word Yahweh. Anytime in your Old Testament that you see the, the name Lord or the word Lord in all caps, which is the case here, it means that it's translated from the word Yahweh. Yahweh is the name of God that was even um, for Jewish people, even today many of the Orthodox Jews, um, but in, in biblical times, they would not even pronounce that name. It was, they, they would uh, use just the initials even in writing it. But Yahweh is the name of God that refers to all who, that He is and all of His attributes. But it's, it's, it's especially focused on the fact that He is the God who is 
timeless and, and, and self-sufficient. It, it is, it's focused on who he is. As When, when he was um, speaking with Moses in the wilderness, in the burning bush, Moses said, who will I tell the people sent me? And God said, you tell them that I am sent you. That's the word Yahweh. That Yahweh sent you. And it encompasses all who He is. His timelessness, His self-sufficiency as the God of the universe. And, and He not only stands out of, outside of time, but He is changeless. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so he's, 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 He can be trusted because of that. And so, uh, because He is, is Yahweh, He is also totally self-sufficient. He needs no other wisdom from any other source other than His own. He needs no source of power outside of His own. Um, he doesn't even need to be worshipped and served. He is completely self-sufficient. He, uh, he, 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 is only, he only answers to Himself. And He is also compassionate and merciful and loving and full of grace. And so this is the identity. Yahweh is my shepherd. This is the identity of this shepherd. He's not um, uh, just um, any old shepherd, but He is Yahweh. The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. And so that's the the identity that, of the shepherd that upon which everything else that is presented in this psalm hinges upon. The fact that Yahweh is my shepherd. And then Yahweh is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Now this is, this is personal. So he's not just a shepherd, but you and I, if we belong to the Lord through faith, can confidently declare that he is our shepherd collectively and individually that he is my shepherd. That's what, that's what David is saying here. And, and so that means that all the benefits of having God as my shepherd fall squarely upon my shoulders individually. As well as the fact that in community together as the flock of God, all of the benefits, all of the privileges, all that we have as his sheep is, is a blessing to us, is given to us because He is our shepherd. We are His sheep, Christians. That is important to remember. We are His sheep, and His ownership of us is central to our identity. We are who we are because of whose we are. You should write that down. I didn't make it up. I heard it from somewhere else, but somebody else. But we are who we are because of whose we are. And that means then that our identity isn't wrapped up in our politics. Our identity isn't wrapped up in our sexuality. Our identity is not even wrapped up in our ethnicity. We are who we are because of whose we are. That, that is our identity in Christ. We are His sheep. And so, we can say then that the Lord is my shepherd. And then bring the emphasis to that last word in that statement. The Lord is my shepherd. So we've seen the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And now, the Lord is my shepherd. Not my co-pilot. Not my buddy. Not my prosecuting attorney or my accuser. Not my genie but my shepherd. That means that his care for us is wrapped up in who he is as our shepherd. And he cares for us. And our utter helplessness as, as sheep. So his identity as shepherd has both to do with all of his attributes and who he is. That he's caring. That he gives us protection. That he provides for us. But it also relates to the fact that we are sheep. That we, like sheep, are utterly helpless without Him. It's only our shepherd that can meet all of our needs. And that's a statement to, to really 
think through and to take seriously because so often we try to meet our, the, our needs, the needs of life, in so many other ways. But it's here we're going to see that it's the Lord who is our shepherd. And as we go into the next section of this psalm, it's, it's, it's He that is the one who supplies all of our needs. Now, a word about sheep. Okay? Because sheep are interesting creatures. Um, they are not the most self-defense gifted creatures on the planet, right? I mean, they don't have fangs. They don't have sharp claws. Um, some, you know, rams have horns, but you ever notice how when you uh, drive by a, a flock of sheep, you never see the rams. You know, it's like, where are the rams at? Well, they're probably at home watching the draft, NFL draft right now, right? Um, sorry, football joke. Anyway, um, but no, yeah, the, for the most part, sheep are pretty defenseless. And when it comes to the fight or flight kind of skills, they're left only with the flight skills. And um, the problem with that, though, is that, that their body weight to leg strength ratio is pretty um, unimpressive. And so uh, they can't even run for their lives very well without being caught and eaten. So um, sheep are pretty needy. Um, and so, so they need a shepherd who will provide uh, for them, who will lead them, and who will protect them. So remember, this is talking about us as God's people. Us as Christ followers, uh, if we put it into a New Testament context. And so David, who, knew, who wrote this song, psalm, knew all about being a shepherd. I mean, that was his job as the youngest member of the, of the family, and he had led sheep from pasture to pasture. Uh, for years, he had fought predators. Uh, there are stories of, of David killing uh, lions and bears and, and uh, amazing feats. Uh, so he, he, he knew what it meant to, to have to do that as a shepherd. He had, he had given his sheep the care that they needed to, to thrive. So the time when David went, was being hotly pursued by Saul, who wanted to kill him, uh, he is remembering that the Lord is his shepherd, or when he's leading his armies into battle, he remembers that the Lord is his shepherd. And so David could rely on Yahweh, on the Lord, his shepherd, for everything concerning his life and well being, as well as the safety of the nation of Israel as, itself. And, and so uh, he, he knew what it meant to, to be a shepherd. And he had this great perspective because of his own experience of being with the sheep, of how God interacts and relates to us, His people. And so what follows then in the next stanzas of this psalm are the benefits related to our shepherd being the Lord. Everything after this point in the psalm is true because we can say the Lord is my shepherd. And, 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 and so each of the lines of this psalm actually are so full of meaning that you could preach a sermon on just about every one of them practically. Um, but I, what I'm going to do this morning is simply break this psalm down into three sections, three categories. Uh, the first being about his ulti- uh, unlimited provision. The second being his, uh, about his guiding and protecting presence. And the third being about our place of belonging that we have. All because the Lord is our shepherd. So first, his unlimited provision. We have his unlimited provision because he is our shepherd. Because it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm in want of nothing. I have everything that I need because the Lord as our shepherd is our provider. And because He who is the source of our provision is infinite. Remember, this is Yahweh God that we're talking about. And because of that, we have no reason to look for our needs to be met outside of Him. He's all that we need. 
The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. There's no, there really is nothing else that I need. And so the problem with uh, not really understanding this concept oftentimes shows itself in our relationships, doesn't it? And, and certainly in counseling, I often see this. Uh, but we, in relationships, and in, in some often, so often in marriage relationships and friendships, things like that, um, we tend to see those or look to those relationships as, or those people in those relationships, let's say it's a spouse, let's say it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, let's say it's a friend, um, we look at them to meet our needs. If we're viewing the relationship wrongly, we're looking to other people to meet our needs, and, and, and when they don't live up to our expectations, then there are problems in the relationship. Seen that so many times in marriage, where it's, it's really what that indicates is a, a total focus on self. Anytime there's a focus on self in a relationship, you can be sure that, that over time it's going to be destroyed. Because we place our our, our idea of what's going to fill my needs in the wrong people, the wrong place, when there's only one, our shepherd, who's ever in, been the one who's intended to meet all of our needs. Our, all of our needs were only ever intended to be fully met in God himself, not in others. And yet we tend to misplace that, that, that um, idea that, of, of who it is that provides for our needs, and we, we look to the wrong places. We maybe even look to our society, our government, um, whatever, instead of living our lives squarely on the fact that the Lord is my shepherd, because of that, I have no reason to want. I have everything that I need. Uh, I was reading this uh, past week a book, a um, great book entitled A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. It's by a guy named Philip Keller. Maybe some of you have read that book. It's been around for a long time. Uh, but Philip Keller uh, was a, a pastor, but before he was a pastor, he was a scientist. Before he was a scientist, for uh, a little over a decade, about 12 years, he was a sheep farmer. And so he wrote this book that is so insightful about the, the 23rd Psalm, that gives us such a, a clear picture and, and things both scientifically because of his scientific background and practically speaking as a shepherd uh, and it, that brings so much insight and meaning to, to this psalm. And I would encourage any of you to pick up that book if you can. I know it's like $3.99 on Kindle and, and it's hard, or I mean paperback, it's just about that, same, about that cheap as well. But uh, it's in, it was interesting as I was reading through that book. Um, one of the things that he describes is, is how on one of his, his, the first farms that he had, uh, adjacent to his property was, uh, where, was where a tenant farmer was uh, living and raising his own flock of sheep. Problem was, was this tenant farmer didn't really care for his sheep very well. In fact, his sheep were very gaunt, very um, uh, malnourished. Uh, their, their fleece was always um, not only dirty, but infested with parasites, things like that. So he didn't care for the sheep very well. He didn't care for their food supply very well. So their pasture was always brown and just um, uh, eaten down to nothing. He didn't care for their water source very well. And so you had these sheep that, that, that on one side of the fence, <coughs> excuse me, on one side of the fence um, were just sorry looking creatures. And then on his side of the fence, on Keller's side of the fence, he, his, he was very meticulous and kept his pasture uh, green and healthy and kept his sheep healthy and, and always made sure that they had fresh, clean water to drink. And so his, not only were his sheep fat and healthy, but, but as these other sheep would kind of huddle near the fence, it would seem, he said, that they would be always looking longingly towards the, the greener pasture of his farm. And it's simply because they had a shepherd who didn't care for their needs well. That's the exact opposite of the Lord who is our shepherd. He cares for our needs. And so 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We can say that because our Master, the God of the universe, loves His sheep and takes personal pleasure in them. Let that sink in. He takes personal pleasure in you, His sheep. He loves us. Um, We are His delight. And it's because He is limited in His ability to care for us that we have everything that we need. And His provision for us is conformed to His purpose for us. His provision for us is conformed to His purpose for us. And that is His purpose of making us holy, making us like Christ. And there is um, great, there's great contentment in knowing that everything that passes through the hand of God into our lives is for that purpose and for His glory. So contentment is a key to understanding the fact that God as our shepherd provides us with His unlimited provision for us. So, you, on the other hand, have the discontented sheep. Uh, the Christian who's in love with the world, always wanting uh, and longing to be a part of it. Way, uh, wanting what it has to offer. Not satisfied with the Lord's provision, but always looking for more. Always looking to the other side of the fence for, fu- for, for fulfillment. Which, like fool's gold, always overpromises and underdelivers. Every time. When we long for, for, after what the, Lord, the, what the world has to offer us, we will always come up short if we pursue that. So we worry, we stress out because often we haven't rested in the contentment of knowing our Master, our Shepherd, loves us and is able to provide for us. Look at what else points to our Shepherd's provision for us. It goes on to say, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now, there are certain conditions that have to be in place in order to get a sheep to lie down in a pasture. One of those conditions is that they have to be completely free from fear of predators or any other outside threat. So they need to know that they're safe. Otherwise, they will never lay down. They will always get, sheep are skittish. They're always kind of looking over their shoulder, wondering, you know, when's the coyote coming? When's the cougar coming? Whatever. And so, unless they feel completely safe, and then that safety is provided for them by the shepherd, they won't lay down. And yet here, we see that our shepherd, he makes us to lie down in green pastures. Why is that? Because we can know that we're protected, we're safe in him. They will also not lie down if they're not, if their stomachs aren't full. Sheep are grazers, right? I mean, they, they will move across a field nonstop eating until they're full, and unless they're full, they won't stop doing that to lie down at all. And it's so interesting, so wonderful that in both of those kinds of situations, in Christ, we have all the protection that we need uh, through His Holy Spirit uh, against our enemy, against the predator, Satan, who seeks to destroy us, and yet, because of Christ, we are protected. Um, We have uh, all the nourishment that we need. We are well fed because we've been given His Word. And we've been given His Holy Spirit who applies His Word to our hearts, to our lives. So because of that, we can know that we can lie down in green green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. Not only um, uh, is it true that that sheep will not lie down unless those conditions are met. Sheep will also not drink from fast-moving streams. And that's because they're, they don't, they're afraid. They don't want to fall in and be swept away by the current. And so uh, we, we see here that, that our Good Shepherd, the Lord, Yahweh, leads us beside still waters where we can freely drink 
and be refreshed. Now what that's talking about, what that's a metaphor of, is really His grace and His goodness, His presence, all that He is, that is what we drink in. It's the nourishment and refreshment of His Word. It's the refreshment that we have, the, rest of the, the, the empowerment that we have from, from His Holy Spirit in a New Testament Christian kind of a sense as we look at it from our perspective uh, looking at these verses. So we can drink freely and be refreshed. And so one of the, the greatest provisions then that we see next from our shepherd is the, in the next statement, He restores my soul. He restores my soul. Now there are different ways in which we need restoration. First of all, we need restoration in the form of reconciliation to God with whom we've been separated uh, from because of sin. And ultimately, His provision, because we're talking about His, his unlimited provision for us here right now, uh, ultimately His provision for that sin problem that we have is His Son, Jesus, who's also the Good Shepherd. And what He did on the cross, and when we come to Him by, in confession of our sins and placing faith in Him, we have restoration of our soul. We have the provision of forgiveness. And that is, it goes right hand in hand with what Scripture tells us about how in Christ and what He did on the cross, in the Gospel, God is restoring all things to Himself. Now this is a part of that restoration. That's one facet. Um, we also need restoration when our hearts are beaten down from trials and, and from suffering and discouragement. That's a time when we need restoration. We need that restoration of soul. We need restoration when we're wearing from, weary from trying to do things our own way instead of God's way. Because that can be extremely tiring when we try to do things on our own, when we try to live life our own way instead of living life the way that God has called us to and intended for us to live. That can be so wearying. And when we fall into that pattern, we need restoration from Him. We, when we're stressed and anxious or fearful, we need restoration of the soul. And so here, our, it's our shepherd who restores our soul. And that restoration comes as we, as we trust the Lord, our shepherd, more and more. And all of this is just the provision, the unlimited provision that, that He has for His sheep. And then secondly, because the Lord is our shepherd, we experience His guiding and protecting presence. Because the Lord is our shepherd, we experience His guiding and protecting presence. Look what it says in uh, verse 3, the second part of verse 3. He says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He, he shows us the way of righteousness. He shows us the righteous path so that we can walk in obedience to Him. He is, he is present with us as our guide, leading us in the way that we should live, leading us to faith in Christ who is our righteousness. He does this for His name's sake. Because of His own reputation. Because when we fail to live in such a way that we are walking in the, His paths of righteousness, and we walk along other paths, actually what we do is we are bringing dishonor to His name. So He leads us in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for You are with me. One of those parts of this psalm that we love to cling to because it's so meaningful in those darkest times of our lives. David turns here and addresses the shepherd. Now he's saying, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no, no evil for you, my shepherd, are with me. And so there's a shift there. And he's affirming his protection even in the darkest, most dangerous places and situations of his life. When we walk um, uh, through dark valleys in our own lives, you know, those are the times when we can't see very far in front of us. Those are the times when we fear the unknown. We may wonder what God is doing. 
It's the suffering of this life that we all experience from one degree to another. It's, it's even ultimately, ultimately when we are at death's door. The valley of the shadow of death. And we find ourselves in a place, though, because the Lord is our shepherd, that God is present with us. And it's because of that presence we fear no evil. So the interesting thing about those valleys is that those are most often the pathway to the high pastures, to the lush green mountain pastures that come oftentimes through suffering, oftentimes through going through some of the most difficult times in our lives that we come out the other side and we finally enjoy the provision and the, the, the lush green pastures that the Lord has to offer us. It goes on then to say, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now the rod and the staff are, are two separate pieces of shepherd's equipment. The rod is uh, usually kind of like an elongated club in a sense. They're made out of uh, saplings that um, the the end that is nearest the root is is heavier, a little bit wider. Um, but those the rod was is, is was a, a something that the shepherd would use quite often to protect the sheep. It was something that he could whack a you know a predator with if they were trying to get after the sheep. And so it, it was a, an implement of, of protection for the sheep, kind of a weapon in a sense. But he would also use it at times to discipline the sheep. And it's, in, it's interesting that in both cases, there is comfort that is brought about because of the rod. Your rod comforts me, both in its protection and its discipline. And then there's the staff. That's the, that's the hook-shaped, uh, you know, long stick that we're used to seeing like in nativity scenes, you know, um, sometimes called the shepherd's crook. And that was most often used for, you know, guiding the, guiding the sheep along. It wasn't used to, you know, hit things because it wasn't as heavy and it wasn't really made for that. Um, you know, but, but you, the shepherd would use that to guide the sheep. But also that hook, we know, at the end was often used to fish sheep out of dangerous places. Maybe off a mountain ledge. Maybe to to get them out of a, a, a thorny thicket of some sort. And so, psalmist says here, your rod and your staff, they, they comfort me. These were, these were tools of the, of the shepherd that were used for the sheep's good. And so, uh, that's, that's all associated with the shepherd's guiding and protecting provision or presence for us. And it's because of His presence that we can have peace then. You see, because when we're stressed out, when we are worried about things, when we are suffering uh, times of anxiousness, going through anxiety, what we really need is the Lord's peace. And it's through these things that we're reading about that, that we can experience the peace of God that passes all understanding. We can have this peace. We can have this peace even when our enemies are close by because it goes on to say here, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Here the setting changes from a, a shepherd um, and, and his sheep in the field to a host and a guest at a meal and the table is prepared and there is safety despite the presence of enemies that are lurking nearby. Because the host is present. There's safety. Not only that, but the host, the host shows honor to the guest by anointing his head with oil, which is a common show of hospitality in that culture. He also shows generosity in his provision in the, in the phrase that says, my cup overflows. This is a cup of blessing. And in all of that description, and in what follows, there is peace then for the sheep. To be enjoyed. And then it goes on to say, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. God's goodness is core to his character. All that God is, is good. 
His mercy. Here actually, it says surely goodness and mercy. That's actually the word chesed in the, in the Hebrew, which uh, more accurately is translated um, loyal, steadfast love. So here it's His goodness and His loyal, steadfast love will follow me all the days of my life. Um, and and sh- as, as surely as anything. I mean, it starts off with surely. It's like saying definitely, without a doubt. Goodness and mercy. Goodness and love. Steadfast love will follow me all the days of my life. And with that, we're reminded of what Paul wrote in Romans 8 when he said that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That truth that we see there is also the, the, the result of the, the loving, caring, uh, steadfast love and mercy of the shepherd. There's nothing that can separate us from that. And then finally, the third category here that we see is found right in the last part of the last verse, of verse 6. It says, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So we have a place of belonging. We have a place of belonging. David finishes this, this psalm with this statement. And, and so in the house, or, or the, the reference to the house of the Lord here, David could very well be talking about the tabernacle. Wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be out, of, uh, out of line for him to be referring to, yeah, I will dwell in the tabernacle of the Lord, the sanctuary of the Lord forever. Um, I think what he's referring to here is more related to the presence of God. Of course, the presence of the Lord was in the sanctuary of the, of the tabernacle at that time. There was no temple in David's time yet. Uh, the temple would not be built until Solomon, his son, built the temple. But he had the tabernacle. <clears throat> and in the tabernacle, there was where the, the Spirit of God dwelt in those days. So he may have been talking about the, the idea that I will dwell in the tabernacle of the Lord forever. 24-7. But you know, there's something about that that you know, I've always kind of thought of it that way. But as I was studying, there's something about that that you know, the tabernacle really wasn't a place for human abiding so much. In fact, very few could enter into the holiest part of that. Now, David himself is saying, maybe saying, you know, well, I will live in that place where I can worship the Lord every day of my life, and, and that very may, well may be the case. It's interesting, though, though um, in the context of this psalm, he's talking about a shepherd-sheep relationship and a host-guest relationship where there's a, a flock, a sheepfold, where there's a household. And so, I, I'm, I'm wondering if he's maybe referring more to the idea that there's this household of faith where God, the, the host, God, the master, is always present with us. And is a place where we live in community with others. A place where we have belonging. Of course, that's a, a picture of, of the church. It's a picture of the kingdom of God as we experience it today. He uses the metaphor of the flock. A flock uh, is, is, for the sheep, the safest place to be is, is to be in the flock, especially when the shepherd is present. And so, I have to, I have to think that probably David is referring more here to that it's within this place of the Lord's presence, whether that's the tabernacle or just simply more a, a, more, a broader um, reference to um, the, the place of the people of God, that community that we live in with Him as our shepherd, there is the assurance and the safety, the security of His presence there. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We have a place of belonging. So we have this, we're in this community um, where 
also at the same time in, as, in Jesus' um, description of the good shepherd, we see that that's a place where even the shepherd will leave even the 99 to go after the one who's been lost, who has strayed. To bring them back into the safety and provision of the flock. To, be, to bring them back where He is present. Where He is the shepherd. And now, we've said all this as we've looked at this, at this Scripture. And I want to close very quickly here. But we need to realize that the Lord is... When we say the Lord is my shepherd... We need to realize that the Lord is not everybody's shepherd. And that there's only one way into the sheepfold. And so Jesus Himself, in John chapter 10, describes how, who, what, what that way is. And so if you take your Bibles real quickly and turn to John chapter 10, we'll see what Jesus says. This is a great passage, great chapter. I won't read the whole chapter to you. But... It's, it's the Good Shepherd chapter of Scripture. And Jesus, in verse 7, it says, Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it ab abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The only way into the sheepfold is through the door, and the only door is Jesus himself. Is he your shepherd? As, uh, we, we know that he's given his life so that you can be his sheep, part of his flock. You simply need to turn from your sin in repentance and turn to Christ in faith, believing in Him for eternal life. And I pray that if there's anybody who has not yet done that, that you would today make that step of entrance into the sheepfold where the Lord is your shepherd. So the Lord is my shepherd. The claim, that, that, that claim really is the secret of a restored soul. When we're ravaged by the, the predators of life, the worries and concern that place such a, a load on us and stretch us to the point of breaking, we have a shepherd who cares for us. So the Apostle Peter could write with confidence when he says, humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time He may exalt you. Casting all your cares upon Him. Why? For He cares for you. That's the Good Shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And I can say that. It makes all the difference in the world when I face things like we all do that are stressful, that fill my heart with fear and anxiety. I can rest and find restoration in the fact, in the truth, that the Lord is my shepherd. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for this assurance that we have from Your Word that, that You have not left us in the midst of all of the things that we go through that are difficult, that bring us stress, that cause us to fear, you have not left us alone, but that You are our shepherd and that You care for us. You give us Your unlimited provision and Your guiding and protecting presence. And You've provided a place for us. Because You're, you're our shepherd. Thank You, Lord, that because of Your love for us, because of Your compassion, Your grace, that all of the benefits to the sheep from the shepherd are extended to us. Not because of anything that we've done to earn them, but simply because of Your grace. and Because You love us. Lord, we thank You for that. Help us to live as sheep who look always, at all times, to You for our source of help, 
for our source of strength, for our source of peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.